Mr. Rep. Ken Rehnquist, Dr. Richard Peters Vedan. I want to welcome you all to the afternoon session of uh, Place, Belonging, and Promise, Indigenizing the International Academy. And we're all here, the Blue Center for Global Issues and uh, conference sponsored by the Peter Wall Center. And uh, we're here for a very wonderful afternoon with a talk by uh, Dr. Margaret Mutu, Aber um, Maori <laughs> scholar from Yatoroa, and her topic is indigenizing the University of Auckland. Um, Dr. Mutu is a widely published Maori scholar. She is the head and professor of the Department of Maori Studies at the University of Auckland. She is chairperson of Hariwi, which is a tribal government parliament and she served as a researcher for claims uh, against the government of New Zealand on behalf of her people. And we'll have lots of uh, rich information to share with us over the next uh, while, and there will be a question and answer uh, period to follow. Dr. Mutu. Hi, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Um, I extend my warm greetings from my people of Ngāti Kahu, Te Rarua and Ngāti Whātu in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to, first of all, the Musqueam First Peoples of this place that we are now and whose territory we are. But I want to make specific um, acknowledgement of the elder Larry Grant, who's not here today but has been here with us to support us. Uh, to you, Richard, for keeping us on track all the time. Link for asking me to come in the first place. Thank you very much. Shelley, for your marvellous organisation of this whole and the, the whole thinking behind it. And as you keep telling us, without Georgina and Ashley, well, we wouldn't be here. But to all the participants in our um, round table who have been really, really good. I want to acknowledge also the Peter Wall Institute for sponsoring this round table and of course the University of British Columbia. Uh, I, I went to get straight into this. I've, what I've done is I've given you, um, you should all have a handout, uh, just so that you can, all it is is what's going up on the screen, okay, just so that you can follow it. Māori studies were first taught at the University of Auckland in New Zealand in 1951, so we're quite old in terms of this but very young in terms of British Academy. Uh, but it was taught against a backdrop of strong white resistance to its inclusion in the Academy. Today it is taught in its own small and marginalised department in the Faculty of Arts and in similar units in the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences and in the Faculty of Education. Individual Māori academic staff hold positions in several other teaching and research units, and there are six Māori research facilities at the University of Auckland. Yet Māori student enrolments are only half of what they should be. Māori staff numbers are just over a third of what they should be. Uh, and the Māori student course and degree completion rates are far less than they should be and far less than those of non-Māori. This most unsatisfactory state of affairs is the result of all Māori aspects of the University of Auckland being subjected to white hegemony and hence control. When I mentioned to a senior colleague who works in one of our Māori tertiary institutions and who spent his life fighting for Māori rights, that's Moana Jackson, if any of you know him, that I was presenting a paper entitled Indigenising the University of Auckland, he just looked me in the eye and he said, Margaret, that must be a very short paper. <laughs> so I think a more accurate title for this paper would be Attempting to Indigenise the University of Auckland. All right. In this paper, I will start briefly outlining, first of all, what I believe the University of Auckland would look like if it was indigenised. Then I will summarise the beginnings of Māori studies in New Zealand before considering the history of the oldest department in Indigenous studies in New Zealand, which is the department that I now head, uh, at the Department of Māori Studies at the University of Auckland. 
I will focus on the legacies that have been left by four professors of Māori studies who preceded me as the heads of the program and the attempts each one of us has made to indigenise the University of Auckland. I will then consider the current situation for Māori in respect of the university's governance, its management, teaching and research. I will highlight what I consider to be the pros and cons of teaching and conducting research in Māori or and or indigenous studies within what I consider to be a British-based university system that has been set up in Aotearoa, New Zealand, before considering some of the possible strategies for achieving the indigenisation of my university. Now, <clears throat> the first university was set up in New Zealand 43 years after my Māori ancestors laid down conditions for British immigration into Aotearoa, New Zealand. Those conditions were set down in 1840, and when we think about these things, and I'm talking with Australian, Canadian, and United States indigenous people, we were the last to be invaded by that. But we actually invited them. They didn't invade us, we invited them. Okay. So we're more recent. So we laid those conditions down in 1840 in an international treaty between the leaders of our hapu. Now, I understand that's the equivalent of your bands. It's our iwi that are nations. So it's our hapu, our bands, and a representative of Queen Victoria of England. It was written in the Māori language and was a treaty of peace and friendship. And we call it titiriti or waitangi. It confirms that the constitutional framework and system of laws that have been observed in Aotearoa for many centuries would remain in place and would be protected, that the Queen of England's role would be to take responsibility for the lawless behaviour of her own British subjects recently arrived in the country and to govern them in accordance with Te Tiriti or Waitangi. That's the only reason we entered into a treaty, was because those who had come were misbehaving themselves and wouldn't adhere to our laws. And so we asked their chief to please come out here and keep control of your people. But part of that promise was that British knowledge would be available to Māori. Now, all white institutions, including, and here, by the way, I had to do a, um, a global change. Normally, for Māori, we refer to them as Pākehā. But I know that when I use that term, it'll probably get you to have to do a few flips. So I've just use the word white, which is not a word we actually use a great deal in New Zealand. Um, so, but I am using it here. All white institutions, including universities, were supposed to have been established pursuant to this treaty. Had that happened, then our universities would look very different from what they do today. Māori studies in the broadest sense of the term would be the norm and underpin all disciplines. Instead of the qualifications in a wide range of what I call Pākehā or white studies, and for me, everything we teach in the university comes out of the white culture and therefore is white studies. Um, instead of those being the only qualifications that were offered in our university, as is currently the case at home, Pākehā studies would be one of a range of option, options available. So you'd be able to do studies in different cultures from around the world. The University of Auckland with Te Tiriti or Waitangi in place would be an institution of higher learning where it is the norm that, one, the various branches of Māori knowledge form an integral part of the country's knowledge base and their preservation, development and enhancement is fully resourced and underpins all teaching and research. And that would be the norm. Two, at governance and management levels, Māori hold the most senior positions, having been appointed by Māori in accordance with Māori procedural practice and academic standards. Three, all decisions in respect of Māori knowledge, Māori uh, language, law, and other areas of expertise would be made by suitably qualified Māori. Then Māori decision-making processes would be the norm. The next one, that white knowledge bases, Pākehā knowledge bases, are included and are fully available to Māori. One of the things our people were were always curious 
about how other people's thought and how they perceived the world. And so that was one of the things we wanted, was to understand how others perceived the world, and in particular, the British, when they came. And then the last one is that Māori graduate fully qualified as professionals, not just in the Māori world, but also in the white world, and can walk comfortably in both of those worlds. Now, that's that, um, what did we call it? Fried bread in the stars. <laughs> We're allowed to dream. We have to dream, okay? Because if we don't know what our benchmark is, then we wander around. But that's the benchmark that I said. We're nowhere near achieving these standards in any university in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The primary reason is that white officials never adhered to the treaty they signed. This, of course, is the same uncivilised behaviour they employed in the lands of many other non-European peoples. Instead, and as part of their relentless pursuit of taking over our country, whites created numerous myths about their own supremacy to wage war against us in order to take over our lands and our resources. They also waged war against our language, our laws, our knowledge, our expertise, our culture, and our society in a desperate attempt to wipe us out. And at one stage, you will find white officials in New Zealand talking about smoothing the pillow of a dying race. And they were quite happy to do so. Pity that, we're all still here. As a result, we were reduced to poverty, deprivation, and marginalization. Now, those three words are words that are constantly being used by our Waitangi Tribunal that investigates claims against the British. And they are constantly coming up with those three words, poverty, deprivation, and marginalization in our own land. But we have never given up pursuing the honoring of our treaty or the upholding of our human rights. And we've refused to ever give that up. Not satisfied with achieving this state of affairs, whites created a series of myths that only they could determine who and what a Māori was, where and how we must live, and how we must behave. That only whites knew how the Māori language and culture worked, and that only they could tell the oral traditions and record the knowledge of our ancestors properly. It took us more than a century before we could start having some say about what whites were saying about us. By that time, they had established five universities in New Zealand. Now, New Zealand universities, as I said before, have always been white institutions. The University of New Zealand was established in 1883 with university colleges located in Auckland, Canterbury, that's in uh, Christchurch, and Otago, that's in Dunedin. It was endowed with 30,354 acres of land confiscated from Māori. Two years later, Māori requested that Māori be offered as a subject, so we were in there at the beginning of the setting up of universities, demanding a place within these institutions of knowledge. But it was not until 1928 that it was included as an optional subject. And in the 1940s, the professor of anthropology at the University of Auckland, one Ralph Pennington from the United States, led the fight to persuade his academic colleagues that Māori should be taught. It took him until 1951, before he was finally able to appoint a part-time lecturer, Bruce Biggs, to teach Māori as a stage one subject. Now, Professor Bruce Biggs. And for those of you who are in our round table, this is the guy who gave me so much hard time and grief when I was a PhD student because he questioned every single assumption that I made. <laughs> he was great, but he was hard. Much is owed to the inaugural professor of Maori studies, Professor Bruce Biggs, and the strong language and linguistic base of the program which remains to this day. Although he did not consider himself to be ethnically Māori, and we have a large number of Māori like that in New Zealand right to this day, Bruce was Ngāti Maniapoto, and in his later years contributed significantly to his own nation. He set up the academic field of Māori studies and taught courses in Māori language, Māori society and culture, 
social anthropology, general linguistics, and Polynesian comparative linguistics. However, setting up the field was not straightforward. Bruce found himself having to navigate through deeply entrenched racism in the university in order to introduce some of the building blocks of Māori knowledge systems into the British university system. In doing so, he followed the lead of Māori political leaders of his time, in particular the one that Fiona was talking about this morning, Sir Apirana Ngata. Sir Apirana was one of the ones who fought so hard to get Māori into the universities, but he was also aware of how dangerous and how vengeful the racism was that was carried. And he used to counsel our people to avoid the racism and just keep quiet, play it cool, just keep it down. And so Bruce followed that lead and avoided confronting the racism. Instead, he set up to work, uh, set up extensive databases many parts of which whites could not access because of their lack of knowledge of the Māori language. I think if they had been able to access those databases, uh, they would have banned them. Because what was contained in there were our histories, our talk, our, the, the evidence we later needed for our claims against the Crown that said this is what happened. No, not what happened in, they said happened in that history book. This is what happened. And it was in these databases that Bruce just collected up and put in a date in an archive. Now they included the archive of Māori and Pacific music, which holds a huge collection of Māori music, recordings of oral history and traditions, field recordings, and lectures by traditional Māori scholars, as well as those of closely related Pacific languages and cultures, including Rarotongan, Tahitian, Hawaiian, and Marquesan. And there was also an extensive collection of manuscripts written by tribal scholars in the 19th century on their history, traditions, philosophy, and teachings. And this was something one of the early British governors got our top flight leaders, philosophers, thinkers, to keep them out of his way because they made his life so difficult he contracted them to write down the histories and they wrote thousands and thousands of pages of the histories of their own peoples. And it's still a treasure trove that remains largely untapped to this day. So Bruce, they got taken away, that was uh, George Gray. He became the governor of South Africa. He took that entire collection to South Africa. And in New Zealand, we had the South African collection. So Bruce Biggs went to South Africa, brought the Māori one back to New Zealand, took the South African one to South Africa. <laughs> Bruce also published prodigiously to raise the profile of Māori in the literature, including grammars, dictionaries, Māori language readers, oral traditions as told by the elders, because the academics used to always argue with him, there is no Māori literature, and they would not accept that oral literature is actually literature. You know, we still have those arguments today about that. Oh, tenakwe, I didn't realise you were here, Larry. <laughs> um, the legacy left by Bruce is firstly that Māori language underpins all Māori studies. The Māori language has been a threatened language for about six decades now. And so its survival, revitalization, and ongoing maintenance is fundamentally important. There is a clear understanding that it is the source of full and proper understanding of Māori society, culture, and worldview, and is the key to the survival of the Māori culture and society. And so we still focus on the language to this day. Bruce led the program for more than 30 years. He took early retirement in 1984 as stronger Māori-defined focus was being sought and that would lead to the inevitable need to confront the white racism within the university and he just, he didn't want to be there. But he remained in the department as a professor emeritus and he completed several major book projects and continued teaching and he passed away in 2000. During his time, Māori was starting to take greater control over the field of Māori studies. During the 1970s and 80s, Māori were increasingly challenging white academics for the myths 
They were perpetrating about who we are, for lying about the history of the country, and for misrepresenting those selected aspects of our stories that they chose to use to advance their own colonizing agenda. And I can remember some of those very brave people who would sit in a history lecture and then put their hand up and say, Professor, Sinclair is the one I remember, you are wrong. And he'd say, you, you can't say that, I'm the professor of history. You are wrong. And then they'd get thrown out of the class. <laughs> you just kept doing that and kept doing it and kept doing it. Um, but it wasn't easy. Furthermore, in the 1980s, Māori were insisting that Māori, rather than whites, define what the field of Māori studies is and that Māori controlled the field of Māori studies. So we're in the 1980s then. Then we move on to Professor Sir Hugh Kafaru. He was the second head of Māori studies at Auckland, and it was significant that his hapū or band is the one of the Auckland Isthmus. So he was there in his own territory as the professor and head of Māori. And he is Ngāti Whātua Ki Orake. He took up his appointment in 1985 at a time when Māori staff and students with the support of a large number of white staff had been protesting for several years about the lack of any visible evidence of support for Māori on the campus. Under his stewardship, the University of Auckland allowed the building of academic facilities to house Māori studies staff, and that was opened in 1986. We had no problem, or relatively little problem, getting a building that was for academic purposes. But the next one, there was much more difficulty, and that was a marae. And that's our traditional communal meeting complex, with a meeting house and a dining room. But we got that opened in 1988. And then a kohanga reo that many of you will have heard of. Those are our Māori language preschools that we have, um, immersion preschools. That was opened in 1995. The entire complex became the centre of Māori activity in the University of Auckland and an appropriate venue for the Māori community to interact with the university. It provided a strong, highly visible and permanent Māori presence on the Auckland campus and for Māori students and members of the Māori community, a culturally safe place for them to gather, study and learn about the Māori world in an otherwise alienating university environment. Now, I've got a, a series of pictures that follow on from, photos that follow on from this. This is our marae, the, um, one, this is our meeting house over here, the dining room over there to your left. And then <clears throat> that flagpole in the middle is quite significant. The flag that's flying off that is called our, we call it our Tinoranga Tiratanga flag. These days it's actually acknowledged as the Māori flag of Aotearoa New Zealand. But back in the time, it's always been perceived as the Māori sovereignty flag and always very threatening to whites in our country. And so when they wouldn't let that flag fly on the Harbour Bridge in Auckland on Waitangi Day, I went out and bought one of them and flew it on that flagpole and I have never taken it down from that day to this except when it gets, so, gets blown about and it gets a bit tattered and I have to take it down and put up a new one. That's, so that's what our marae looks like. The first slide we had right at the beginning, that's when you're standing outside the gates looking in. This is once you're inside the gate. Next one. This is the meeting house itself, very intricately carved, both inside and outside, all traditional carvings. And the carver, the master carver, even though this stands in the, in the territories of the northern nations, it was carved by one of Fiona's. Um, relations from Ngāti Puro. Next one. This is the inside, and we do a lot of teaching. The, the, this house is used for a great number of gatherings, our people, but we do use it for teaching because around it are the stories and histories within the carvings, like your carvings, you've got a lot of the oral tradition is in those carvings. And so we use that as a teaching space as well as, as well as space for a number of other gatherings as well. Next one. These are two of the carvings that tell the stories of my uh, tribal backgrounds and each of them, every single stroke and 
on it will have a reason for being there and have a story behind it. I have often said to my students that if I could, I would get you to do a degree on the contents of this house because it's more than just the history, it's also the philosophies, the thinking, the whole epistemological background is contained within this meeting house. Those are just two of about 40 of the particular, we call them Poe, the posts around the house. Next one. Including this one, which is the, this one depicts our relationship with the Pacific Islands. They're very, very closely related to us and we do consider them to be our relations and that's why we included them in the house. And that's a mixture of Marquesan, Tahitian, um, there's Hawaiian representation in there as well. Next one. And then you've got a bit of modern stuff. This isn't traditional Māori, but it's the window at the front of the meeting house, which I think is great. Um, it faces uh, the north, which means the sun comes in it all the time, and it's just a beautiful piece of artwork. Next one. Now, this is outside of our academic wing, and these are our students training, practicing for their kapahaka, which is our, our traditional dance. And they all, they're comfortable to practice there. And straight above there, not the office with the blinds down on it, but the next one, that's my office. And I love it when the students are sitting, are practicing there. And the reason they do it is because there are glass doors there and they act like a mirror. So they can actually watch themselves training when they're in there. But I, I love it when the students are doing that um, and training for, for the um, competitions that they have to go into. Next one. This is inside of our academic wing. That uh, po or, or post that we have there, that has a whole story behind it. And it's about um, the very great care you need to take with knowledge and what happens when you do not take care of knowledge and it runs rampant uh, and becomes quite dangerous. Next one. And this is our kohanga reo. These are where our young children are. And it's the children of our, uh, several of our students and also our staff take out their students down there and everything, uh, take their children down there and everything down there is in the Māori language. Okay, next one. I think that's the last photo. All right, now under Sir Hugh, the focus of the department's work shifted to addressing the needs of Māori communities. Staff were employed who were active in their own tribal and urban communities and some of the more urgent and pressing needs of Māori communities were worked on in order to find solutions. There was also a concentration on the theoretical and practical aspects of Māori sovereignty and implementing the universities and the Crown's Treaty of Waitangi responsibilities. Now we call it Te Tiriti or Waitangi, but in English it's known as the Treaty of Waitangi, and I'll explain a bit more about that later. In 1991, Hugh guided Māori studies through the transition of being a subsection within the anthropology department to a separate, albeit much smaller, department of Māori studies. And it was like being liberated. And you didn't like to say anything to the anthropologists because they'd always sort of be nice to you. But we wanted to be free. Um, and then once, many years later, I said, yes, well, we um, sort of got divorced and we said, no, no. And I said, well, maybe not for you, but for us. <laughs> it gave Māori studies greater freedom to develop more in accordance with Māori needs and wishes than was ever possible previously. The department started to challenge discriminatory legislation and policy. This drew attacks from parts of the majority white population and the university was called on to dismiss us. To its credit, the university has never entertained these demands and has always rejected them. But I have to say it's more to do with the legislation than anything else, because as critic and conscience of society, we are statutorily protected in New Zealand. Um, provided we stick within our area of expertise and we quote from our own research, we cannot be touched. And the university knew better than to try and fire a Maori, you'll end up in court. So, in 1992, Sir Hugh retired but remained as a professor emeritus and continued teaching and he passed away in 2007. The next one was Professor Ranginui Walker. And who did I see who had Ranginui on there? Um, I think it was Joanne. 
had, had a picture of, of, yeah, did you have Rangi Nui on, on your one? He was the third head uh, who expanded the program beyond its language and anthropological focus to include Māori aspects of political studies, resource management, feather, fibre, stone and wood technology, the old traditional ways of making um, art artefacts. Māori studies was becoming increasingly Māori focused and driven. During this period, the enrolment of Māori students increased from 30% of the Māori studies enrolments in the mid-1980s to 70% in the mid-1990s. Sorry, the late 1990s. The department's roles peaked in 1995, but then student numbers dropped off with a significant, num uh, significant loss of white student numbers. And what was happening was that white students were starting to feel threatened in Māori studies because they could no longer dominate. But I think some of our Māori students were a bit mean to them at times too. And I caught a few of them sometimes and I said, don't do that, don't do that. We invited them in here. You learn to look after them. It's one of our base values of being able to look after people. But the thing was, a lot of them walked. In 1993, a review of the department highlighted the inequitable allocation of resources to Māori programs as opposed to European languages and cultures programs in the university. Furthermore, central government, and this is where we had worked outside of the universities, at the national level, they started to direct universities to teach Māori aspects of most disciplines. Now, as a result of that, staff, and I've heard people talking about having to do this, staff of the Māori Studies Department were expected to contribute lectures to many other departments and faculties who lacked Māori staff and training. And in particular, both Rangi Nui and I got called on to go and give lectures in medicine, law, engineering, architecture, planning, sociology, anthropology, Pacific studies, environmental science and geography. You know, and you've already got a full teaching load of your own and you've got to go and do these things. And as I heard someone was saying this morning, you did it. Like you were saying it too, Fiona, you did it. Because it was about being strong about our own discipline. But... This had a major impact on our research time because you were too busy teaching for everybody else. But the university took a long time to recognise that. So, you know, you start getting held back for promotion, you're not getting things because you're too busy servicing other departments. Rangi Nui led a major initiative to address the shortcomings in the university structures and programmes in respect of Māori studies. But medicine and education were the only disciplines to start starting to address Māori issues in any substantive way. And they did so by establishing the Department of Māori Health in 1996 and the Department of Māori Education in 1997. However, both struggled with lack of resources. So it was, the, it was just the energy and the determination of the staff that set them up, but then they had nothing to run it on. So you were running it on nothing. We call it running on aroha, you run it on love. Hmm, yeah, right. <clears throat> Didn't last long, you know. Now, the subjects of law, architecture, planning, history, sociology, art history, fine arts and business did appoint Māori staff. Yet too often they struggled with being isolated in a white environment with no Māori support and ongoing racism. So the, the legislation was requiring the universities who were requiring the departments to have these people there, but there was no support for them. In there. During this period, Māori staff across the university worked together to compile a set of recommendations to address the university-wide problems and to relieve the pressure on the Department of Māori Studies and Māori staff throughout the university. In 1997, the University of Auckland established the position of the Pro Vice Chancellor Māori at senior management level for responsibility for Māori issues across the university. Now we thought we had it made. When we got that, we were right up at the top. Rangi Nui was appointed to that position to implement the recommendations that had been made by Māori staff. In 1998, he conducted a major review of Māori right the way across the university and recommended a large number of structural changes and the redistribution of resources to implement the university's obligations to Māori. But 
He retired in the year that he did that report. We needed him to stay. And this, is, this continuation on of this leadership is often so crucial. The fourth head that we had was Ngāpare Hopa. And she oversaw the department through a very difficult period as it struggled to cope with significant decreases in Māori enrolments that were affecting all university Māori programs throughout the country. So it wasn't just Auckland, it was everywhere. Ngāpare introduced new courses in urban issues, kapahaka, that's our um, performing Māori performing arts, you people all know the All Blacks and the haka they do, that stuff. And media studies, because we have always perceived that while government might be this, the most powerful, media is equally powerful uh, for us and equally damaging. So we appointed people in uh, media studies, but we were severely hampered by the increasingly hostile environment to Māori in, throughout the country. During her tenure as head, Professor Graham Smith came to be the Pro Vice Chancellor of Māori at the University of Auckland. Māori staff across the university were working towards implementing the review recommendations that Ranginui had come up with and bringing all Māori related teaching into one administrative unit, either as a standalone faculty or as, or as a school, because we wanted to stop people being so isolated and marginalised, so we thought we'd bring them all together. However, hmm, the numbers of Māori students across the university declined significantly, and that had a dramatic effect on the Department of Māori Studies where 70% of our students were Māori. Apart from the very high cost of enrolment, because during that period, um, university f fees for university students just skyrocketed, and the first ones who couldn't afford to go to university were Māori. Then, but what you could get then, of course, was student loans. And then student loan debts for Māori were just spiralling out of control. So they were deeply indebted. But the third and most significant thing that was happening was that Māori were setting up our own tertiary institutions. And they were far more culturally safe and delivered programmes more relevant to many Māori. And many of their courses charged no fees. You know, and we were up against that and being told, well, why haven't you got as many students as you had two years ago? We'd say, look at what's happening out there. You offer them the same things and you'll get them back here. But of course the department wouldn't, uh, the university wouldn't. Now, despite these obvious setbacks for the department, it came under sustained attack from the Dean of Arts because of those falling roles. And what happened then was you got down into survival mode. And so the whole impetus we had, where we thought we were just it, we were going to sort the whole university out, sort out all the Māori things, and then this hit us. So he forced the cancellation, that Dean of Arts forced the cancellation of several courses and laid off staff. Staff numbers dropped from 13 effective full-time staff. Now, you, you would have had maybe 20 odd bodies around the place, but in terms of full-time equivalents, we had 13 at that time and he reduced them to 8.5. The threat of a communi Māori community backlash, along with intervention from the Pro Vice Chancellor Māori from Graham Smith, and the likelihood of litigation, prevented the Dean from actually closing down the Department of Māori Studies, but we were getting to a point where we're being threatened with closure. Staff offered very strong resistance, but their morale was severely damaged. There's only so long you can keep taking on this sort of thing. When the Pro Vice Chancellor of Māori, when Graham Smith, found that he was unable to implement the main recommendations of the 1998 review, he took extended leave and a position at this university here, the University of British Columbia. And that had a lot to do with the fact that the recommendations that we'd been working on then had to be passed through senior management. When Graham brought them back to us, we said to him, Graham, that's not what we said. And he goes, but that's what the senior management has said. And we said, go away, Graham. And yet he was one of ours. But senior management got to him. So we felt quite sorry for him, but he was left in an invidious position of having to visit upon us um, senior management. 
uh, stripping back the recommendations that had been approved. As for our head of department, Pare Hopa, she gave up and resigned. <clears throat> and that was in 2001. And she did it while I was on leave. And when I came back, I said, Pare, what have you done? Oh, I've left it for you, Margaret. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Pare. <laughs> so I took over the department in 2001. And I returned the focus to research and publication and empowering Maori communities. We had honorary research fellows appointed and Maori studies became a member of Ngā Pai o Te Māra Matanga. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that uh, institute. It's the National Maori Institute of Research Excellence for Maori Development and Advancement and I'll talk to you a bit more about that later on. In the department, um, PhD completions became a priority and um, we were talking about that yesterday, about how we'd got that PhD program going in Aotearoa, and that was Linda Smith and Graham Smith setting a target of 500 PhD, Māori PhDs, and it was taken up right the way across the country. Um, in my department, uh, we managed to contribute 14 of those students, uh, PhD students, uh, since 2001. But it was, it was a major, it was to get our people qualified to be able to fight the fights. Māori politics um, was put on a formal footing early in my tenure with, as head, with the appointment of a political scientist that I um, uh, pinched from Waikato University. Uh, staff conducted many media interviews and gave public lectures to counter the political environment which was becoming increasingly hostile to Māori. There was a significant backlash from the white, uh, right-wing white politicians who called for us to be dismissed. And one of the things that white politicians know that they'll get good coverage in a newspaper is if you attack a Māori, and a particularly an educated Māori. They will always get coverage, because educated Māori, we've worked out, are a threat. Um, once again, the university rejected their demands, um, and we, we, just, we just have a little giggle to ourselves whenever that happens now. Frightening when it first happens, but after a while you realise that it's just the way they operate. Now the difficulties experienced by Professor Hooper continued. The department was embattled uh, with the Dean of Arts and the newly appointed acting Pro Vice Chancellor Māori. Now this acting Pro Vice Chancellor Māori, he was a retired judge. He was of the Ngāpuhi, or is of the Ngāpuhi nation, but turned out to be quite badly internally racist. Now, by, by what I mean by internally racist is that you internalise the racism that's been visited on you and you believe that only the white man can tell you what to do and that the white man can determine who you are and what you will do. So we were quite blown away when we saw how this manifested. He made it clear that he would not tolerate Māori staff questioning white supremacy, referring to those of us who did as the Māori Taliban. Um, and when he said that to me, to my face, I said to him, Mick, go back and look at yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask who you are. Um, he encountered significant, as you might imagine, significant Māori backlash when he urged the return to white hegemony in our teaching, in our department and in our research, not only in the Department of Māori Studies but also in Ngā Pai o Te Māramatanga National Māori Research Institute. So he wanted us to forget about all our Māori knowledge, forget about all our oral traditions, and just follow on from where the white researchers were going and have them leading our research. He closed the James Henare Māori Research Centre. Now, this brought down the wrath of the northern nations down on the university because that centre had been set up in response to appeals from the elders for the, to the university to service the research needs of our people in the north. And yet he closed it down, and he was from the north, and he closed it down. But by this time, Māori studies was at a very low ebb. So battle, battle, battle wears you down. Then, in 2004, there was a national assessment, and this is what I've been talking about before, a national assessment of the quality of research 
and tertiary education institutions was conducted and it concluded that the University of Auckland was the top research institution in the country. So it was universities, Crown Research Institutes, technical institutes, anywhere where research was carried out, you all went into this assessment uh, process and the University came out, the uh, University of Auckland came out at the top of it. It had an average quality score of 3.85 out of a possible seven across the university. But it also concluded that the Department of Māori Studies at the University of Auckland was the best Māori Studies department in the country, and at that stage, by a very long shot, with an average quality score of 5.3 out of seven. So well above the university average, and we were actually eighth out of 58 of the university departments. Now, just this year, there's been a recalculation of that 2004 um, ranking, and it took ours from 5.3 to 6.8 out of seven, um, which made us the second uh, to top department in the University of Auckland. Now, we knew intuitively that we were good because of the legacy left by Bruce Biggs, and that's that thing about excellence that I keep going on about. That was why we knew that we were, we weren't hopeless, we weren't the Maori Taliban. But both the Dean and the Acting Pro Vice Chancellor eventually, eventually resigned. Whew. I have to say, um, some of the white staff eventually hounded them out of the university. A new Vice-Chancellor was appointed. He apologised for the closure of the James Henare Māori Research Centre and reopened it. A new Dean was appointed and supported and protected the Department of Māori Studies from further attacks. So it comes down to who the individuals are in the positions. As a result, we have been able to appoint staff in Māori Media Studies, because we lost the previous ones, and in Māori Development. Now, moving into the current situation. In terms of governance, the current situation at Auckland is that the University of Auckland Council, its governing body, has no provision for the appointment of mana whenua. Now, that's our word for the traditional owners of the land, like the equivalent of the musqueam here is um, our mana whenua, um, of the lands that the university sits on. So there's no provision, but the Minister of Tertiary Education has four appointees, and provided that minister is supportive, they'll usually try to make sure that one of them is Māori, not necessarily mana whenua from the area, but just Māori. However, the most recent appointments, um, we've discovered it has to be Māori acceptable to the senior management team, and someone who will not question or challenge white hegemony in the university. So, you know, these are the sorts of battles you're up against. Now, the next part, I'm sorry, is not on the slide. Uh, I don't know how I missed it. Academic governance is the responsibility of the university's senate. Its membership includes all of the university's professors, the heads of department and senior management. There are only six professors who are Māori out of a total professoriate of 303. So six of us out of 303, and two of us are heads of our departments. The Māori professors and heads of Māori education and Māori health, because those two are not professors, they do attend, do, sorry, do not attend Senate regularly. I try to go as often as I can, only because I'm often the only Māori in Senate. And the reason we don't go is because any comments or contributions any of us may make on Māori issues in that body are most often ignored. And I can say to them, this university must address the fact that we are not servicing the needs of the Māori community in our curricula. And then I say, and you can do it by doing this, this, and this. And there is just a deathly silence in this huge room that's got over 200 people in it. And they move on to the next matter on the agenda. <laughs> the other area you can have influence is in the strategic plans. Now, the 2005 to 2012 strategic plan stated that, and I quote, the university is committed to the mutual rights and obligations articulated by Te Tiriti or Waitangi. 
It included that the university provide programs that recognize Māori aspirations and contribute to Māori intellectual and cultural advancement. Now, Māori staff had worked really hard to get that sort of meaningful wording into that plan. So we went in there and did that. Um, now, but the problem was that that work was completely undermined by the key performance indicators set for achieving those goals. They were aimed only at assimilating Māori into the white university and had nothing to do with what our aspirations were. The measurements were percentages of Māori students and staff and percentages of course and degree completion. You know, nothing about curriculum. And all of these were set very low. The two, at the end of that period, so we move on to the next one now, um, and down to these, because these, these are the figures. In 2012, 6.8% of the students, and that might sound high for you guys, but 5.7% of the staff were Māori, even though Māori make up 15% of the national population. And I'm well aware that we have the highest percentage population of Indigenous people out of New Zealand, Australia, Canada, United States. Um, but as you can see, that is far less than what it should be. The successful course completion rate for Māori was 82% compared with the overall rate of 90%. Now that doesn't look too bad, I'll talk about that in a minute. The degree completion rate for Māori is 49% compared with an overall completion rate of 62% in the university, that's nowhere near what it should be. Now, these key performance indicators for Māori student and staff percentages were maintained around these horrific, for me, 6.8 and 5.7, they were maintained around that. So the university didn't even aim to get high. You know, you could set it up at 9 or 10. Maybe I won't make you put it up at 15 yet, but take it up a bit higher. They kept it at 7 for the students and at 6 for the staff so that it didn't really matter if they didn't get too far away from it. Efforts to improve the pass rates. So the pass rates, 82% overall is 90. They were a lot more successful, mainly because of initiatives designed and implemented by Māori staff. And in my department, in the Department of Māori Studies, the pass rate for Māori students in our department is actually 92%. It's higher than the average. So, there was, um, by the way, where that was best implemented in um, a white faculty was in the Faculty of Science, uh, where Rangi Nui Walker's son, Michael Walker, uh, is a professor over there, and he worked that through his faculty, and they've had extremely good pass rates over there. Um, however, there is no attempt made to address the serious systemic inadequacies in the university curriculum, which does not offer any degree that is entirely Māori focused. Every single degree requires you to have a white focus in there. Now, in light of the ongoing lack of support at senior management and council levels, when we got to the next strategic plan, 2013 to 2020, Māori staff just did not bother to put in the same effort because you put a lot of effort in, doesn't get you anywhere. The result was that the university's statutory obligations in respect of the treaty are now severely downgraded. No longer is the university committed to its obligations and responsibilities under Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the authoritative treaty. Rather, it is now merely, it now merely acknowledges these things that they call principles of Te Tiriti o Waitangi slash the treaty of Waitangi, which you know might seem like a bit of um, semantics, but it's not. The Treaty of Waitangi, the English thing, is actually a separate document. It's the fraudulent document used by the British officials to falsely claim that Māori ceded sovereignty of New Zealand to the Queen of England. It was never seen by our, our ancestors. It's not the one they signed. It's not the one they discussed. But it's one that was produced by English officials later and claimed to be the treaty. It's not. So they brought that one in. Then the principles are something that's been sorted out in the Court of Appeal and in the Waitangi Tribunal, and they are based on the false assumption of British sovereignty, white supremacy, 
and Māori inferiority, and that's what those principles are based on. And the university has now put those principles into its strategic plan. So essentially, the university's current strategic plan entrenches racism against its Māori staff and students. Now, whether they perceive that, I doubt it. But for Māori, we see it as a huge backward step in the articulation of the university's responsibilities. Moving on then to management. In terms of management, there's still a pro-vice-chancellor Māori. The current incumbent was appointed against the advice of senior Māori academic staff. Hey, he's a lovely guy, okay? But he's not an academic. And he struggles to understand the academic and scholarly requirements that produce top-flight graduates and scholars. He hasn't been through Bruce Biggs. <laughs> He's a retired secondary school teacher and a national politician. He was appointed to increase the income to the university which results from higher Maori enrolments. The government will give you extra funding according to the number of Maori that you get in there. And so that was what he was employed to do. Um, and to keep any potentially difficult and embarrassing Maori issues under control. And he's a politician, and politicians are very, very good at doing that sort of thing. Improving the curriculum or the teaching and research carried out by the university so that they can better meet the needs of Māori students and communities are not matters that he can grapple with. Um, we sit down with him and say, come on, Jim, we need to do, and we talk research, or we talk teaching to him. And he listens, and then the next thing he's doing is talking about recruitment of students into the university, and we think, it's gone in one ear and straight out the other. You give up. The Pro Vice Chancellor Māori convenes a runanga. Now, a runanga is a traditional council of representatives. Both Fiona and I serve on our own um, nation's ones. But this is one within the university. Māori staff fought to have members appointed according to our own Māori law. Membership, however, has been determined by senior management and does not include direct representation from either my department or Māori education. Now, my department is the hub of Māori things in the university, yet we have no representation, representation. We have to be there because it's delegated to us by somebody else. Um, and there is no place on there for the local traditional owners either. Its membership is dominated by management. In theory, the Runanga advises the University Council on all Māori matters. In practice, the Pro Vice Chancellor Māori provides information to the runanga that is given to him by the Vice Chancellor and identifies and neutralises any potential attempts by Māori staff and students to challenge white hegemony in any part of the university. Māori strategic needs do get raised, but they're rarely addressed. And you know how adroit politicians are at, you know, just foisting things off and saying, yes, now we'll deal with that in that subcommittee, and we'll deal with that in that subcommittee, or I'll refer that to so-and-so, and that's what happens. The runanga has no power or authority, and as a result, the academic staff positions, there are six academic staff elected positions on there, they've been vacant for many years. All you have to do is look up on the website of the University of Auckland, see who's on the runanga, and all the staff positions, empty. It's a waste of time. Current situation in teaching. There are three Māori-focused teaching units at the University of Auckland. There's my Department of Māori Studies, we call ourselves Te Wānanga o Waipapa, and then two departments located in the professional faculties, that's in the Department of Māori Health, Te Kupinga Hauora Māori, the faculty, in the Faculty of Medicine and um, Health Sciences, and the Department of Māori Education in the Faculty of Education. Distance keeps these departments separated. We are physically a long way away from each other. This combined with the dominant white requirements of our respective faculties makes collaboration between us difficult. Each contributes to courses to, courses to degrees in Pākehā or white studies. So our, we contribute mainly to a Bachelor of Arts. In um, the education, it's the Bachelor of Education and Teaching and over in the medical school, the Bachelor of Health Sciences. 
Since 1998, Māori staff and students have repeatedly requested inclusion of a Bachelor of Māori Studies in the qualifications offered by the university. And there we would require that Māori language be a compulsory in that degree and the basis of Māori studies, but then they could major in medicine, law, architecture, anything else that is offered in the university, and it would be a Bachelor of Māori Studies in Law, a Bachelor of Māori Studies in Medicine, a Bachelor of Māori Studies. We haven't been able to get it. And we actually put up a very detailed submission. We costed the whole thing out, and we're told there wouldn't be enough people interested in it. And all that does is make the Māori students furious, and the Māori staff go, Argh! This is the reality. So Māori studies is still a very small department within the Faculty of Arts. Our focus remains the language in Māori and its revitalisation, maintenance and enhancement. We also teach and carry out research in oral traditions, cultural and social issues, tikanga, that's our Māori law, including constitutional matters, and that's becoming a very important issue for us in Aotearoa because there is no written constitution. I think there is. It's te tiriti o waitangi but it's not recognised. We need a written constitution in New Zealand. A youth from the United States, can you understand not having a written constitution? It just... Um, cultural and social issues, uh, sorry, politics, kapahaka, our performing arts, and our um, media fibre, uh, sorry, fibre, wood, feather, stone technology. Our staffing includes 10 full and part-time permanent academic staff and 14 part-time temporary lectures and tutors, but they total just 8.4 full-time equivalent staff. So you've got a lot of bodies, but very small appointments. This is just over half the average number of 16 full-time equivalent staff for all of the departments in the Faculty of Arts. So we are very tiny within the Faculty of Arts. We have 145 effective full-time students, so a lot more bodies than that, but full-time, effective full-time, 145. That's just 39% of the average of 367 for all the departments in the Faculty of Arts, so we're very small. We have two administrative staff, one Professor Emeritus, three PhD students, that's actually the lowest number of PhD students we've had many, for many years, and three honorary research fellows. Over in the Department of Māori Health, despite its name, it is more than a department. It's located in the School of Population Health, and while it is not accorded the status of a school within the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, it does operate its own cost centre, and the head of department has the role of Deputy Dean Māori, so she's up at the faculty management level. As such, it has far greater standing and autonomy within its faculty than the Department of Māori Studies has in the Faculty of Arts. Now, the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences recognise the inequities suffered by Māori and Pacific Islanders, so they deal with us together, in white schools that has left them ill-prepared for and unqualified to enter university medical and health programmes. They're very elitist programmes uh, at the university, well, anywhere in New Zealand. The decision to set up Māori Health Unit in the 1990s was the faculty's attempt to provide some resources to address those inequities, the shocking health statistics out there for our people. To do this, they currently have just 11.5 full-time equivalent academic teaching and tutoring staff, one research assistant, two PhD students, one honorary research fellow, and 13 administrative staff because of the programs, the support programs they have in place for the students and recruiting the students, and a large number of casual support staff and elders on their books. This is a relatively small number of staff. It might look big, but it's not in university terms. Despite this, they have worked steadily on increasing Māori and Pacific Island student numbers and now support over 400 in the faculty. Uh, and over 200 of those, they're Māori and Pacific, so it's not just Māori in there, are in the medical program. So you're training up doctors and you've got 200 in there in all, that's a five-year degree that they go through. There's 200 in there at the moment. Department of Māori Education, I wasn't able to get all the um, uh, stats on this one. Uh, it's a department in the Faculty of Education. 
Its programs include a one-year foundation certificate program for people who like to develop their Māori language, culture and tertiary study skills. Then there's the Bachelor of Education teaching Huarahi Māori. Now this is a teaching degree for people confident in Māori language who want to teach in Māori immersion or bilingual schools, but they have to also be taught how to teach in white schools. And I cannot see why they can't just concentrate on being able to teach our children or, or those who choose. Actually, by the way, we get quite a few whites who do come into our Māori immersion schools. It's lovely to see those graduates, these white people who stand in front of you and speak Māori beautifully. It's lovely. Um, and then they have postgraduate courses in teaching supervision. On their web page, there were 19 teaching and tutoring staff listed. Many of those carry out research, and I found three administrative staff, but I don't have the number of students um, and the effective full-time numbers either. Now, the current research position. This one here looks flash, okay? Six, Māori-focused research units at the University of Auckland. Ngā pai o matanga is the biggest by far. This institute was set up in 2002 it is funded by the Tertiary Education Commission. It's a government department, so its funding, ongoing funding, is not assured. It gets a big budget for us um, of uh, about four million a year, um, and it's hosted by the University of Auckland. It supports Māori and Indigenous research aimed at bringing about positive change and transformation in Māori communities, and it comes from an entirely Māori point of view in its research, all its researchers do. 16 Māori-focused research entities throughout the country participate in that institute. It produces and publishes two academic journals, Alternative, the International Journal of Indigenous Peoples, and that's the one I would encourage you, if you're needing to publish in a journal, this is the sort of journal we would like to see um, stuff coming from around, um, particularly Australia, Canada, and um, United States. And then one for New Zealand, um, Mai the New Zealand Journal of Indigenous Scholarship. Te Farikura, which I head, is the Indigenous Knowledges, Peoples and Identities Research Initiative. It's relatively new, established in 2009, but the aim there was to bring Māori and Pacific Island staff across the university together, because we're all pepper-potted around the university and, and isolated bring them together to develop collaborative research projects for the benefit of Māori and Indigenous community. It funds preliminary work on projects to get projects up so that you can go after the big funds. And it provides support for funding applications and for international collaborations. And we will often bring people from Hawaii. Link comes down to see us. We bring Karina has come down to see us as well. Um, to, and that comes through Te Farikura. James Henare Māori Research Centre, I've already mentioned, for the Northern uh, Nations. It's a small centre established in 1993. It has to find its own funding to survive, as do all of these um, ones. Metasazi Research Centre for Māori and Pacific Economic Development. It's another small unit established in 1998, and that one's in the business school. Tōmaiora Health Research Centre in the Faculty of Health and Medical Science is another very small one. And the sixth one, Tai Haruru um, Māori Legal Academics Group. It's a very small group uh, in the Faculty of Law, established in 1994, and it has a journal, Te Tai Haruru, Journal of Māori Legal Writing. So those research centres are extremely important in terms of setting the baseline for information for our courses that we're teaching. Now the next thing I want to look at is the pros and cons, and this is the question that I would like you to ask yourselves too. What are the positive sides of staying? You know, we get pretty critical of our universities, but there are some very good benefits in there. There are also drawbacks. So some of the, these are some of the things that I consider to be the benefits and drawbacks. The resources available to New Zealand's British-based universities are extensive and they're the best available and far more than any Māori institution or group could ever access. And the quality of that, of what's in the universities, far surpasses anything else. The university's role as critic and conscience of society is statutorily protected. 
which ensures that university staff can openly criticise within their own areas of expertise without fear of reprisal and without fear of losing your job. Now, I know that doesn't, I've seen that not work in the United States where people are fired for what they say. You cannot fire um, in New Zealand, but you've got to stick to your own area of expertise. I must say it's, it's a hard road to hoe, that one, but our people expect the academics to get out there and do it because they can't. Because it's not always available to Māori in Māori institutions. And we've watched them come under attack from governments for successfully challenging government policy, and they use it to take away their funding, just, just horrible to them. They would never try that sort of tactic on a university, ever. In the university, there is a critical mass of highly motivated, supportive colleagues, both Māori and non-Māori, and we can never underestimate the, the support that we've had from non-Māori staff. Now, I've said non-Māori rather than white, and it's white and others, because one of the strongest supports that I've had over the years is from Chinese, and that, because they've been treated the same as us, um, and they've been very good. So they are able to deliver significant benefits for Māori. The drawbacks. The most significant is the institutional racism that we've talked about all week, which pervades all the university and means that Māori are struggling for a fair share of resources and for proper recognition and inclusion of our knowledge and expertise. Māori staff and graduate students find their teaching and research is always subject to approval by non-Māori. And personal and institutionalised racism does take its toll on isolated staff and students and they often give up and leave. So possible strategies, and this is another thing I'd like you to be thinking about. So we do all this stuff. What strategies are you going to put in place to try and do something about this? The lack of any real and meaningful Māori representation at governance and senior management levels of the University of Auckland has severely handicapped its progress and in the development and advancement of Māori knowledge and expertise and there remains strong white resistance to the incorporation of Māori knowledge into the university's overall curriculum and distinct discomfort with those staff, particularly those in the Department of Māori Studies, because we are at the cutting edge of, of challenging the white system. Um, so those of us who refuse to allow Māori presence and our knowledge to be devalued in the academy. Māori staff across the university work incredibly hard to provide better and more relevant conditions and courses for Māori students and to conduct research that is relevant, meaningful and beneficial for their communities and we must keep doing that. Um, and I, I think I might have left it out. When I said that we don't have that support at governance and senior management, we've got to get that support back in there. That's part of the strategy is to get the support back in there. Make sure the right appointments are made up there, so you've got to be in there with those appointments. Uh, <clears throat> so even though you're trying, the staff are trying their hardest and working really hard, they invariably run into white resistance. In terms of student recruitment and teaching resources, I consider that the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences has made the most pro progress. They've had deliberate targeting and they target right back into the secondary schools and they go to, you know, the beginning, the 13-year-olds the first coming into secondary school to target the potential ones for medical school and then they mentor them through. Um, it takes a lot of resource and I have to say it's externally funded. Um, Yet curriculum there is still based on Parker or white studies and the white world view, although the Department of Māori Health tells me that it is strategising to help develop hauora Māori or Māori health as an academic discipline. I used to challenge, um, two of my children have gone through that faculty and I used to get <coughs> annoyed that they were only being trained in white medical stuff and I used to challenge their... Uh, their lecturers and they keep saying to you, oh, Margaret, yes, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Support at senior management level will be essential if this is to succeed, if they're to get a hauora Māori, uh, Māori health discipline. 
but past experience of white resistance to attempts to make these types of changes in the university's curriculum would seem to indicate that it will be a long and difficult battle. That doesn't matter. The battle has to be fought. You just get in there and do it. It's clear to me that we will continue to have to battle to make real progress until the time comes when the institutional racism in the university is addressed. For such a transformation to take place, there do need to be significant changes in both the attitudes and the personnel at the most senior levels of the university. And sometimes you have to recognise that the people that you've got up there are just not the right people. What I do at the moment is I just say, Taiho, just wait, just wait. He can't be there forever. Wait till the next one comes. But when the next one comes along, make sure you're in there on the appointments panel to make sure that it isn't one that's hostile to you or one that can't do what needs to be done. However, we cannot underestimate the determination of our junior staff and in particular our students to have these sorts of attitudes set aside. The work carried out by our six Māori research units and in similar units at other universities and at Māori tertiary institutions has contributed to a rising assertiveness in Māori communities as we move to take greater control of our lives. As a result, the next generation is much better informed and much less willing to tolerate the attitudes and behaviour that my generation has put up with. Our biggest hurdle has been getting whites to acknowledge their racism and to start redressing the damage it has done. It was therefore a pleasant surprise for me last week to watch a debate on national television which saw viewing audiences voting overwhelmingly that New Zealand is a racist country and that well, the viewing audience voted 76% in favour of New Zealand is a racist country. Now that's a huge hurdle to get over. Because um, once you've got it acknowledged, you can do something about it. Given the shame that's associated with being racist, I foster the hope that institutions like the University of Auckland may see fit to ask how it can rid itself of the scourge and repair the damage it has done to its Māori staff and students. And in conclusion, I have been in the University of Auckland since I enrolled as a first year student in maths, chemistry and physics in 1970. There are significant drawbacks in that university for Māori. Its ongoing reluctance to accommodate Māori knowledge as part of the core curriculum has seen Māori students and staff migrate to more relevant and culturally safe Māori institutions. The only structural accommodation it has made is to put more effort into assimilating Māori staff and students into its white hegemonic structure. Yet despite this, it has been able to deliver information, resources and expertise for my people that could not be accessed anywhere else. And this is because even though we encounter white resistance, we have always had support from a number of our white colleagues. They helped us establish each of our teaching and research units and the work being done in them is helping to make some positive differences out in our communities. It might be slow, but it's happening but the university still has a very long way to go to provide for Māori to the same level that it provides for white immigrants to our country. I hope to see it make much more rapid progress in that direction before I retire. Kia ora tato, my final greetings. It was just right, <laughs> Cook Sham, Kiora, for a very rich description, a comprehensive description, and insightful analysis of the journey yeah. that you've been on. And uh, you and your colleagues and your relatives went before you are to be congratulated Thank for you. what you've accomplished. Um, for myself, I know other my colleagues, we've always looked to University of Auckland, in the Otoroa, yeah. to see what can be accomplished. Mm -hmm. You've accomplished you know, incredible things. Um, we've looked to you for you know, the models 
to put in place. We're also now looking at you as being the canary in the mine. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah we to be that we can't relax yeah. because I have a sense that at the university we are on the threshold of some of the things mm. and we need to be diligent. We need to be, you know, it's not a linear fashion. We cannot take anything for granted. You know. So, I'd like to invite Dr. Shelley Johnson to come forward to make a gift. Uh, it's my pleasure, Dr. Mutu, to have you here on traditional Coast Salish territory. I, what I appreciate so much is the directness and the naming of the issues that for sometimes us junior people without tenure can't say in the same way that you can, and I really appreciate that. I want to let you know that we had a visitor and I was sitting at my chair um, about 10 minutes into your talk and for about 20 minutes past that, an eagle came and sat on a branch just outside and was listening to your talk as well, which is very, very strong medicine here. Uh, on behalf of our Indigenizing the Academy, I have a small gift for you. And it is the, um, the logo of our storyteller. Uh, made for this uh, round table, uh, done by a Musqueam artist, mm -hmm. Ray Sim. And it says, for Dr. Margaret Mutu, indigenizing the International Academy. And I want to thank you so much for being here and for being the leader that you are and being the role model for those of us that are coming behind. I also want to say that I wouldn't be here as an academic scholar if it were not for Dr. Graham Smith, who came and spoke with my elders, Joanne and Dr. Irabena Rigney, and talked about the 500 Maui people that you wanted to graduate. It's because of that, that that program was implemented here at the university. And it, that's the reason that I'm standing here as an academic. I want to thank you and all of the people that you work with for those contributions. I just want to say thank you for your presentation because this is very, very much what we speak of here. And I am not an academic in that, in that sense. Uh, I'm here as an elder in residence. And it took me a few years to realize the words that the untenured people cannot say. I have the ability to say as an elder. And I, and I do my best to move that. And I really, really want to say thank you for showing us how much you've accomplished down there in that, in the sense of indigenizing the University of Auckland. It, it's, it's a huge struggle, but it's a, it's a struggle that we've got to carry. And my experience is through work life and for over 40 years working and talking, this struggle that we speak of, that uh, maybe it's because I don't have a concerted uh, focus that I'm still doing it. <laughs> so, but I really want to say thank you and your colleagues and your husband to, to be here and be with us and showing us how much you have done and how much the Maori people have done. And I know our, like, our community is the home of the Garen case, which I believe uh, Maori has used in, in, in the struggle against the, the, the Treaty of Waitangi mm -hmm. in trying to refocus it to the, yes. uh, uh, was it, to Treaty? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that, to me, is, is something that we have in common here, that we have that part of it that is, is a long struggle against colonization and assimilation. And I really want to say thank you. I, I really don't want to belabor it all. So I really say thank you. I I